Wales climate. Richard Hollingham reports. Antarctica is the largest and undoubtedly coldest wilderness in the world. Its only human inhabitants are the hundreds of scientists who spend the brief summers collecting new information. Although it's now almost entirely covered in snow and ice, below the surface is a whole continent locked by the cold. It's hard to believe that once dinosaurs roamed through forests where now there are only bare rocks and glaciers. The importance of Antarctica for the world's climate has been recognised for years. The ice sheet holds 90% of the Earth's fresh water and affects weather patterns and the world's oceans. Now scientists are hoping to find out why 35 million years ago Antarctica froze in the first place and why the Earth changed from an ice-free planet to one with two massive areas of icy wilderness. They've been drilling through the ice. So far, the results should give them a record of what's happened to the climate over the last 20 million years. The next stage is to go back in time even further to when the ice first formed and try to find out why. Dr John Smiley is one of the scientists who's been carrying out the research, so he came into the studio to talk to News 24's Jackie Hardgrave. Now, how far have you got? Have you got any definitive answers yet as to not. why Antarctica froze over? Absolutely not. Uh, it's too early. Uh, we've done one of two field seasons. Um, the first season, unfortunately, was curtailed because the, the sea ice we were using as a platform uh, broke up early and they had to retrieve the drilling rig and take it back. So, oh, only so what are you physically doing there? Then? What are we doing there? Mm. Okay, we're using the sea ice as a platform uh, to drill into the sea floor. We have to use the sea ice because um, it's an appropriate place to actually get at the, the rocks we're looking for. Um, we're drilling through 200 metres of water and we're trying to achieve a uh, continuous cord section extending in age from 30 million years back to about 100 million years, looking at climate evolution during that period. Why, do, why is it that the rocks will give you the answers? What's in a rock that will give you the answers you want? It's a, a proxy record. You can't actually record climate by itself. Wind doesn't get uh, preserved in any shape or form. Rain doesn't either. So we're looking at particularly how the Transantarctic Mountains, which face the Ross Sea, very close to where we're drilling, how they're being uplifted and how they're being eroded, because potentially the uplift of the Transantarctic Mountains was a forcing factor that actually pushed the whole world from a hothouse world, where there were no polar ice caps, to the present ice house. And why would that have happened? Why would what have happened? The, the uplift. Why would it, what would have triggered it all off? Well, we don't know. Change is presumably very deep in, in the interior of the Earth, uh, melting, hot spots, things which um, this project is not designed to actually attack. We're actually looking for um, more superficial processes involved. So once you, is, how long do you think it will be before you're able to say, OK, we've sorted it out, this is what happened? Well, I hope we'll be able to sort it out, but you never actually know. We think we've got a very good shot at it. Uh, say the first season of work, which we're just reviewing just now, was slightly disappointing because we didn't actually get as much core as we would like. But the second season, which is in, you know, starting in October, hopefully we'll get about 700 metres of core, we'll achieve the depths we want, and we'll get all the information we require. We have a very good chance of coming up with a very good answer, but you can never predict the outcome. When you say a very good answer, what sort of uses? I mean, what, what will that enable you to, to do that you couldn't do before? Well, the switch from a hot world to a cold world, if you can put it that simply, um, we're not sure how rapid that switch was. And there will be information in these rocks which will tell us the kind of rate, the pace of change, whether in fact it was a progressive change over many millions of years, but it was a very rapid change. There are views which say that it happened very suddenly about 35 million years ago. Other people say it started much longer before that. And the rocks will reflect this, believe me. A team of scientists say they've finally proven that birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. Writing in the science journal Nature, they say two new species of dinosaur discovered in China have solved an argument about the origin of birds that's been running for years. Our science correspondent James Wilkinson reports. The new discoveries settle the matter. Birds are living dinosaurs. Rather like ostriches, but smaller, the two new species of dinosaur could run, but they couldn't fly. But they were covered in feathers, and that's what links them to today's birds. They were found in China, in an area where many fossil discoveries have been made. Scientists believe the two new dinosaurs are more primitive than birds, and represent an earlier stage in evolution. The earliest known bird that could fly was this one, Archaeopteryx. The new dinosaurs have long legs and very short front limbs, which means there's no way they could have flown. But scientists say they're now convinced that birds and dinosaurs are closely related. 
just looking at this, you can say that, well, if we were back in the Cretaceous, 55 million years ago, and we looked at the animals around us, we would see things which were quite familiar, like birds. And we would also see things which we traditionally called dinosaurs. And really, we would conclude that there's no difference, that they're the same. The fossils show the clearest evidence of feathers yet. One of the animals had a plume of feathers in its tail, which it may have fanned out rather like a peacock. This discovery makes it clear that animals originally grew feathers not to help them fly, but for some other purpose. They may have helped keep the animal warm. They may have been used as camouflage or possibly in mating displays. Scientists believe it's one of the most significant dinosaur discoveries for years. The world's coral reefs are in danger, according to their first detailed scientific review. It shows that 60% of them are damaged or threatened due to human activity and says coastal development, pollution and farming are to blame. Robert Piggott reports. Corals, tiny marine animals, live in cavities in their distinctive limestone skeletons. With them live algae, which produce the oxygen and nutrients coral needs. It's a fragile relationship, easily upset by pollution and the washing of eroded soil into the sea. The increased siltation, actually due to the destruction of forests, um, actually results in coating the reef. So it puts a layer of soil um, over the top of the reef, which cuts out light and oxygen and kills, basically by suffocation, the animals living on the reef. Other hazards include the harvesting of coral to be smuggled abroad and sold as ornaments. This is just a tiny part of an illegal shipment of coral seized recently by customs of 20 tonnes. But in Southeast Asia, individual companies routinely mine four times that amount every year for use in construction and road building. It means that a tenth of corals have already been reduced to a wasteland of rubble. Almost two-thirds of the rest are in danger of going the same way. And we need to act now if we're going to save what is surely one of the most beautiful and exciting heritages of natural heritages of, of man. Corals provide a habitat for thousands of marine species. Environmentalists say the world can't do without them. We'll stay with marine life as scientists have discovered how a small sea creature can have a major impact on Britain's coastline. The European research is centred on the limpet. It may not seem much, but it's turning out to be rather important. Richard Hollingham reports from Dorset. Every year, Britain's coastline gets a battering from the waves. While rocks and defences may protect the coast, it needs something much smaller to protect the shores. Well, I like to think of limpets as being sort of the equivalent of sheep, but, but on the shore. Uh, in farmland, it's the grazing activities of sheep that, that keep, keep grassland as it is and stop trees and other things proliferating. Well, limpets do exactly the same thing on the seashore. If um, limpets are removed, due to human activities, um, in some places they're eaten and in other places they're quite susceptible to pollution and the whole character of the shore changes. Limpets are only a couple of centimetres wide but with their razor sharp teeth they can strip rocks bare. Here in Dorset scientists have been trying to find out just how important limpets are and how they affect our coastline so they set up an interesting experiment. This is plot three. Okay. The experiment involved fencing off small areas of rock to see what would happen without the limpets. Similar areas were marked off where the creatures could graze freely and the two were compared. The results are pretty clear. Without the limpets, the shoreline suffers. If there weren't limpets on a shore like this, there'd be loads of seaweeds going all over the place and the shore would be dead slippery and people would be falling around and uh, the whole nature of the, uh, the coast would be changed. So it's clear limpets make a difference. The trouble is they come in for a pretty rough time from fishermen and even walkers. Along the coast at Kimridge Bay, they're trying to educate people to help the limpet. It's mainly during the hot summer months and we get lots of bored kids coming down and they see the limpets and they, just, they don't realise what limpets are, they don't seem to realise they're actually animals and they just kick them off. And um, it was in 95 we'd had a very hot summer and uh, the other warden, Peter Tinsley, came down and he saw lots of limpets being kicked off and some had been used for bait and uh, he decided that we really ought to try and stop this and so he uh, knocked up a sign and we developed our limpet protection zone. It's hoped that more and more people will recognise the importance of limpets and their contribution to Britain's coasts. So the message is, if you want to keep our shores free of slime, 
Remember to love a limpet. Researchers believe they may have made a discovery which could help people.